And when Horus found that Isis would not aid him betray Osiris, he plotted with his conspirators to kill our Lord. He took the firebird, the rod, and slew him. This is the first truth and is the testimony of Baphomet. And a great cry went up to heaven when it was learned that our Lord was dead and would not walk in the garden again. Then brother fell on brother and fought like beasts and slew those they most loved. Even their wives and children were not spared the sword. Much blood was spilled to his name and the suffering was terrible. So great was the love they had for Osiris. This is the last part of Genesis, the history of the people of Isis, the Nephilim, and the secret remains that men have kept the identity of the goddess hidden, though her signs are everywhere if you have eyes to see them. Here ends the first garden, though this paradise shall come again, for the world goes on. One scientist, I don't recall who it was, made an interesting comment that the universe is not stranger than you imagine, the universe is stranger than you can imagine. And the point being is that you haven't learned anything until you understand how the pyramids were built, the geometrics, the harmonics, uh, the well-established mathematics. Uh, I don't see how anyone could possibly um, <coughs> say that they are well informed about the modern day world and not realize the importance that this country has played in the development of Europe and the rest of the world. I remember someone saying a long time ago, always trust a person looking for truth. Never trust the one who's found it. The point being is that real divine truth is far, far out ahead of whatever we might begin to understand. Manley Palmer Hall, one of my uh, very good friends, said in a, one of his lectures, um, if you can intelligently explain to an audience something about God that everyone can understand, then that proves that you don't know anything about God because the God that your key brain could understand could not be the one that created the universe. The one that created all things is far, far loftier than we have uh, given a correct view of.
to make this a part of a school system seems to be very interesting. Now, I go back to Egypt, a very colorful country, for certain principles to discuss. In Egypt, the Egyptian was not born a citizen. This is interesting. When you came into the world, you were an, Ip an Egyptian, but you were not a citizen of Egypt. You might have been born on the steps of the pyramid, but you were still not a citizen. This was because it was deemed that citizenship, mature participation in the labors of the state, required dedication, enlightenment, consecration, and if necessary, self-sacrifice. Now, children in Egypt, up to around 15, 16 years old, wore a child not lock of hair. It kind of hung down over the left eye and down onto the shoulder. A thin lock of hair. And this was called the child lock. And as long as that lock of hair was there, that person was not responsible for knowledge which he did not possess. He can, could not be blamed for mistakes that he did not know better than to make. But there came a ceremony finally, and in the presence of all concerned, the priests of Thebes and Luxor and Memphis gathered together those who were aspirants to become citizens of Egypt. And they had a great ceremony and convoked the gods and made, made these young people accept the responsibility of Egyptian citizenship. And from the records we still have of those old times, we get some key to what the instructions were. The first instruction was, you must obey the laws of the gods of Egypt. You must obey the laws of Osiris and Amentet. You must obey the laws of the state, unless you are a true law abider, you cannot be a citizen. You had to be truthful, honest in your weights and measures, kind to those in need, helpful for the forlorn and the sick, forever charitable. And at this point was introduced the great negative confession of the Book of the Dead. When the Egyptian died and went into the other world, they believed in Egypt, that he had to answer to the gods of the underworld for his reputation on earth. He had to be able to give a statement of the, that he had kept the 600 rules by which the Egyptian regulated his conduct. Maybe he couldn't keep them all, but he did the best he could. But he was working always under the pressure of being a good person, a dedicated person, and an Egyptian was an individual who could stand out upon all sides and prove that in every way he was trustworthy honorable, honest, enlightened, and kind. After he had taken all these obligations so far, the little lock of hair was cut off, and the child became a man or a woman, became an Egyptian citizen, having the privileges and rights of a citizen. But without this bond, it could not happen. So let's move this forward into another type of world and see what we have here now. Supposing we had, not here, a citizenship by birth, but a citizenship by dedication. Supposing instead of being born an American, we went to school, the lower grades, middle school, and finally graduated from high school. At the time of high school graduation, then citizenship would be a matter of consideration. When the American boy or girl decides to go in for a life of government or statesman's craft, they should not be out merely to get money. They should be reasonable wages, proper salary, proper things necessary. But everything should be pointed to the fact that the citizen is a servant of the needs of the people. Now, if we began producing people who at the age of 14 or 15, decided they wanted to be Americans.